We've had in some detail already in the show, which is the fact Washington Security Committee demanding to know how the British jihadist who took uh, people inside a synagogue near Dallas hostage and, of course, finally fatally shot by American security services, Malik Faisal Akram, how he ever got into the US in the first place. Mohammed's in Birmingham on this. Seems to be a failure, Mohammed. Is that right? Well, um, where, where should I start, Nick? At first of all, beginning. it's really nice to speak to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I listen to... Uh, I listen to your uh, show every morning, and this oh, is the you. first time I've called in. Great to have you on. Uh, yeah. So, uh, first thing, um, I, I must say I feel so- sorry for Sue Gray. I hope she's a very busy woman. Oh, anyway, right. let's right. not talk about that. Okay, sir. I think, I think, Nick, the British government has to take the bull by its horn. Okay, what we do you mean? What does that mean? So... Uh, I'm a doctor, as you know, uh, and ah. I remember uh, when we were uh, doing our oncology uh, classes, mm. uh, one of our professors said, you know, cancer is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. Sorry, what, how, is, how a, is this pertinent to this terror, uh, this jihadist who... Because seems, ah. he's a member of a Tablighi Jamaat, which has been banned in Saudi Arabia, okay? Right. Now, if you go to Dewsbury... They have got a huge, big centre. Right. My point is that when would British government wake up and do something substantive? There are more than 3.5 million Pakistani, Bangladeshi Muslims in Saudi Arabia. Right. They don't have any problems there. How right. are they controlling them? So what you're saying is, as this person had come to the notice of MI5, there should have been further work done, or certainly the US authorities alerted to that fact upon his arrival. Absolutely. Okay. But, but right. the point is that, uh, uh, look, Nick, what happened with Bateley Grammar School? Yes, we're, we're going a little off subject, and I'm very grateful to you, Mohammed, and thank you for the work you're doing as a doctor. Please understand, I'm only letting you go because I've got a senior member of the government coming on, and we do have other matters to explore. Mohammed, have a safe day. Thank you. Uh, and let's welcome to the conversation uh, Armed Forces Minister James Heapy to touch on something that actually um, I aired yesterday, which was, was floated the idea there would now be a medal made available to the military personnel who helped with Operation Pitting, as it was called, the evacuation from Afghanistan. My understanding is James Heapy is here to confirm the above. Morning, Minister. Is that the correct? Is that the tr- is that right? And what was the initial hurdle that had to be cleared? Good morning. Morning, Nick. Uh, it, it is true, uh, and it is uh, well deserved. Uh, around a thousand service personnel will get a medal for their service in Afghanistan, not pit- or not pitting. Um, and the the hurdle that had to be cleared is that this is a um, this is a change in medal policy. Effectively, um, the norm for medals. Uh, hitherto is that they've required, I, I think, 28 or 30 days of service in, in an operational theatre to qualify. Um, indeed, you know, all of the medals that, that I won during my time in service were on the back of six-month tours. But I think and I hope that uh, everybody who's won a medal for their military service will reflect that while stop pitting was only two, two and a half weeks long, it was two and a half weeks of the most extraordinary intensity and that actually um, servicemen and women wearing uh, a medal proudly presented by Her Majesty the Queen for their time in Kabul during those two and a half weeks is well deserved. And just to remind my listeners, of course, you served as major. You served in Kabul, Northern Ireland, Basra and Helmand province, just to give everyone the background of your military career. Um, When we, of course, when Operation Pitting closed, it was hoped that there would be an attempt to bring thousands of others of people into the United Kingdom through other forms of passage. How many have we been able to get out of Afghanistan? Uh, It's about 2,800 that we've brought out since the end of op pitting uh, and steadily, quietly, we're getting on with it uh, within the MOD, bringing out around 250 a week, uh, mostly through uh, Pakistan. How long will that continue? Uh, Indefinitely. At, at that sort of number, you would hope, Minister? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think, Nick, I would love to be able to, you know, fly a load of planes into Kabul, scoop up a thousand people yeah. in one go and bring them out. It's not realistic. Um, people are having to get out through a number of routes, um, none of which I should really disclose to your, no, your I listeners. No, I understand. I understand. Um, I'm, I'm sure and, you... and I think, you know, this is uh, maybe the reassuring point to make uh, uh, in response to your question is that these people haven't been forgotten. This isn't... Uh, a line of activity that has just disappeared out of view. 
I take multiple meetings a week, every week. I speak to our defence attachés across the region every week. We are constantly pushing and exploring for new routes. I have visited uh, Uzbekistan and Qatar uh, looking for routes as well as uh, lots of conversations with our friends in Pakistan. Um, we're bringing people out at the best pace that we can, but our commitment to those who served alongside our armed forces during our time in Afghanistan is absolute, and we will keep bringing people here for as long as people who are eligible want to come. All right, well, well, well done. On the subject of it, and well done to the teams that have worked so hard to keep that going. A couple of other subjects. On, on the subject of medals, uh, it is reported that uh, Her Majesty the Queen will be giving Jubilee medals to all members of the royal family. Do you think the disgraced Duke of York deserves one? Uh, I think that's a matter for Her Majesty the Queen as to who she gives medals to. He's also left certain regimental titles and command positions. Would you feel ready to salute him? Were you serving under him? Well, uh, again, uh, Her Majesty the Queen has already Her made Majesty the decision. Her Majesty the Queen doesn't decide, Minister, to... whether you salute someone or not. Well, she has removed the uh, the uh, honorary colonelcies that the Duke of York held. Uh, and without wanting to be trite, Nick, as a civilian, um, I wouldn't salute a member of the royal family anyway. But um, Was she right to strip the Duke of York of those titles? Well, I think that that is a judgment for her. But uh, within the MOD, we uh, made a point of uh, regarding that as a matter for the royal household and not wanting to intrude on uh, things that are very much in Her Majesty's gift. All right, lastly on this, what sort of figure does the Duke of York cut for you at the moment, Minister? He was a well, military I, bloke too, as were he you. Is, he is out of public view. Um, my personal reflection is that uh, his associations are horrifically ill-advised and he has caused enormous challenge for the royal family in a year when we should be celebrating the extraordinary service of Her Majesty the Queen as she reaches her Platinum Jubilee. Um, but I'm also a Minister of the Crown and um, I think it'd be inappropriate for me to give any uh, further uh, comment that, um, that, that, that might risk being too colourful. Let's move elsewhere, literally elsewhere. Can I take you to Ukraine? How nervous should we be about Vladimir Putin's actions? Do you see this when the ground is suitably frozen in a week or so's time? Do you see this invasion that many commentators are predicting? Minister? Um, we should be very worried, and yes. He's going in, is he? Well, I think there is uh, a grave possibility that he may, and I think that it would be an extraordinarily stupid thing to do. Ukraine is a sovereign country in its own right. There is absolutely no chance, as I fear Putin might believe, that the Ukrainians are ready to welcome him as their liberator. There's just no risk of that. I was in Kiev last week, and uh, what I saw was a proud, sovereign nation facing an existential threat and knowing to the very core of their being that they will fight every inch. Now, the UK has played our part in helping them with their preparations. We've sent thousands of defensive, light, anti-armor missiles to the Ukrainian armed forces, and that um, is uh, on the back of some fantastic work by my boss, Ben Wallace, um, to make sure that we can show that solidarity. But in Moscow, they need to be clear. This will not be bloodless. This will not be a walk in the park. The Ukrainians are a proud, sovereign nation, and they are ready to fight for every inch of their country. Strong words. Coming back to the UK, it is predicted that we are going to see an end to plan, so-called Plan B curbs, possibly as soon as today. I doubt that you're the one to confirm that because you wouldn't want to steal the thunder of your ultimate boss, the Prime Minister. But is that how you at least read the mood or the wind is blowing, Minister? Well, I'm not just steal the the the, 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 the the announcement of the Prime Minister, but, but you know, we have a cabinet for a reason. Um, what I will reflect on, Nick, is that... Um, some pretty punchy calls were made uh, in December over how this country should respond to Omicron. Uh, and it looks like we made the right calls. We've come through the wave much closer to the best case scenario than the worst case scenario. And that gives Cabinet a very early opportunity to consider whether or not those restrictions are, are, ever requ uh, are still required. And lastly, noting that you are within the Ministry of Defence, 
What sort of defence was proffered by the Prime Minister yesterday as regards his attendance at a party, no one told me I was doing the wrong thing? Is that a kind of defence, Minister? Well... It's a nice play on words. I, I'm going to answer, um, reflecting that's, that's on my... That's what I do. Now I want to hear what you're going to do. <laughs> I, I'm going to answer reflecting on my, my previous job as his parliamentary private secretary, um, because I think that very, very few people get to see what the day-to-day -day life of a prime minister looks like. Um, the reality is, and I was looking at some of his, uh, at, at some of his diaries um, from when I was working with him uh, last night, and... His diary is put together in five-minute blocks. He might go from a call with a world leader to a national security meeting to a meeting with ministers on domestic policy to a, minister, to a meeting with advisors on COVID policy, and then someone comes and grabs him from his study, and in the 30 seconds it takes to walk down the stairs to the garden, he is pre-briefed on who he's about to see and what he needs to say. Um, now, I know that lots of people won't be willing to accept that as an explanation, but as somebody who has worked in that environment, I can well see how actually prime ministers don't know what is in their diary until it hits them. And, you know, as the PM said at the dispatch box the other day, in hindsight, he should have shut that party down there and then. He didn't. He's apologised for that profusely. People are furious. My inbox is glowing white hot with constituents who are incandescent at what they are hearing and seeing. But, you know, the Prime Minister stood up at the dispatch box and that is, that is effectively to speak on oath. The ministerial code requires us as Ministers of the Crown to be accurate in what we say. I am choosing to give a man that I've worked with closely the benefit of the doubt and to believe what he has said at the dispatch box. But for the millions of people who are listening to your programme, who don't want to give him the benefits of the doubt. I just ask that they wait for Sue Gray's report before they make any further judgment. Grateful for your time as ever. Thank you, James C.P. Armed Forces Minister, appearing here on LBC, where at two minutes after eight, the news is next with Holly Harris. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at just after 8 o'clock, a group of the newest Conservative MPs are reportedly planning to submit...